When we're doing investigations in sort of far-flung areas or extreme circumstances, the, the very biggest structure of the universe, the very smallest things, the things that happen at extreme energies, it's very difficult to do experiments. What you have to do instead is say, what would be a beautiful explanation of what we know that could explain a little bit more? And then work out the consequences of these aesthetic guesses and see if they work. <laughs> I think that you can capture certain aspects of beauty objectively, and I do think that nature embodies them. I think we can say objectively that patterns of high symmetry, things that you know, look the same if you move them around in different ways, humans find beautiful. They use it in ornamental art across many, many cultures. It's also a feature of the natural world. And then you go to the level of physical laws, and there you find more abstract concepts, but really deeply geometrical concepts used, and a symmetry of the equations, which means that the equations can be transformed in many, many different ways, and yet have the same content. It's equations of high symmetry and conceptual perfection that turn out to govern things in the actual physical world. A large part of what goes into the human sense of beauty is adaptive. Evolution has evolved us to enjoy interacting with things that kind of make sense and, and are powerful guides to how the world works. And that's why it's not entirely a coincidence that things we find beautiful are the things that help us understand how the world works. I look for things that might have beautiful solutions. So I'm looking for problems that have both intellectual beauty and conceptual significance, but also that say something about the real world. I think in broad contours, the scientific method has succeeded in understanding the physical world very profoundly. But the question of purpose, that's entirely different. I was born into a family of second generation Americans. Our family was Roman Catholic, especially my grandparents, you know, from the old country, they very much had those traditions. I was very, very taken in the idea that the world had a meaning and a purpose. It's understanding the glory of, of the universe, of God, uh, of the creation, and sort of appreciating it and trying to live up to its promise. It's in many ways not incompatible with the life I took up, so to speak. As I learned more about science and studied philosophy, as well as studying the catechism and the, the, the theology, if you, if you like, I had a kind of crisis trying to reconcile the two. You know, I'm a theoretical physicist mostly, but actually interacting with the world is very helpful in keeping grounded. And the point of it is not just to spin out fantasies, but to actually describe and interact with the world and control the world. And of course, I went off in a scientific direction, but I never lost my aspiration to try to reconcile or to replace what was there and kind of finding the purpose and meaning in the world. I think we can imagine futures, and by imagining futures, we can focus on what's a good one, what would we like to see happen, right? And that could become a purpose. I think it puts things in perspective when you get this deeper understanding of what the world is all about, how the universe works. You realize that humility is very much in order. 
Cosmic self-respect is also in order. And optimism, if you learn about the potentials that are not yet exploited, that are revealed by fundamental understanding, it points to a potentially very bright future where people can be healthier, wealthier, and wiser than they are now. But to me, just the fact that the world is so splendid, each of us as a human being is gifted with potentially a life full of experience and joy is good and does, you know, so far as you identify the origin of that with God or with you know, whatever you want to call God, that shows us the world is good. Yeah.